Welcome to the Megacast. I'm Tyler Keefe, welcoming you to our live, local, five days a week TV, radio, and streaming show looking into all things Michigan. Today we'll talk to a number of different people about a whole host of fun and interesting stuff and important news stories right here in the Great Lakes State. Let's get into today's headlines on our website, civiccentertv.com. On our local news page, our top story today comes from Ron French at Bridge, Michigan. A court of claims judge has ruled that the Michigan law banning abortion is unconstitutional and should not be enforced. Judge Elizabeth Gleicher made this ruling on Wednesday afternoon, stating that the law would see people who cannot uh, see people who can get pregnant, quote, denied appropriate, safe, and constitutionally protected medical care, and, and close quote, and deny those same people a right to bodily autonomy. If the 1931 law were to be reinstated, violators of the law would face prison time of up to four years and fines upwards of $5,000. And physicians and clinics performing these procedures could face steep penalties as well, including revocation of their medical licenses. Uh, that, so that is the ruling on the 1931 law banning abortion in the state of Michigan. Of course, pre uh, previously there was a, an injunction put on the law that made it unenforceable in the state while uh, legislators and, of course, while the courts were deciding the legality of this, uh, of this statute coming from the law in 1931, of course, as the federal government in the a recent case that revoked Roe versus Wade then put the power of deciding on the legality of abortion being uh, as a state-to-state -state issue. So, of course, Michigan's uh, law was from 1931. They already had a law in place that banned abortion, and therefore, uh, by constitutional law, it would have revoked it back to that. But the injunction that was put on that, that particular law uh, prevented it from being immediately enforced after the revocation of Roe versus Wade, and now uh, the Court of Claims Judge Elizabeth Gleicher uh, striking it down as unconstitutional. I'm sure this is not going to be the end of this story, we'll probably hear more arguments. This was, this is likely going to be an issue that continues to go up the chain in the court system uh, until this law is decided on one way or the other. Also making headlines today on CivicCenterTV.com's local news page from the Detroit News is Melody Batons. The iconic Lafayette Coney Island in Detroit has been closed following an issued citation from the Detroit Health Department. The notice read that the, that the 98 year old institution, quote, is not to be engaged in business or use as a food service facility until approved by the Detroit Health Department and closed quote. Detroit Chief Public Health Officer Denise Ferrazzo said that the inspection that led to the shutdown was prompted by tips from residents who reported rodents in the building. Razzo also told reporters, quote, we have been working with Lafayette. They did shut themselves down voluntarily, but then they reopened later that day. So we issued a cease and desist and closed quote. No timeline has been reported just yet on when the restaurant may reopen to the public. Finally, making headlines on civiccentertv.com's local news page today from the Detroit Free Press's David Jesse. Eastern Michigan University has filed a lawsuit against its striking faculty, asking the court to mandate that they return to the classroom as the fall semester pushes onward. EMU claims that the strike is illegal due to the faculty being employees of the public, it's a public, public university, uh, who, of whom are not permitted to strike under state law. Under state law, state employees are not eligible to go on strike. Eastern said that the strike would cause, quote, irreparable injury and closed, quote, to the university as well as, as its non-faculty -fac non staff, students, and so on if the strike is not ordered to cease immediately. Officials from the faculty union responded following the lawsuit's filing saying, quote, our strike against the EMU administration's repeated illegal unfair labor practices will be settled at the bargaining table not in the courtroom. Instead of filing lawsuits which have no merit, EMU administrators should focus their efforts on good faith bargaining so we can reach a fair agreement which supports our students." And closed quote. All those headlines can be found on our website, civiccentertv.com, on our local news page, as well as those other helpful links to aggregate and up-to-date information on COVID-19 from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention at the federal level, the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, statewide and locally, uh, from the Oakland County Health Division. We have a great program coming up ahead on this Thursday edition of the Megacast. Up next, therapist Carrie Craywick from the Birmingham Maple Clinic joins us to kick off today's program. You're watching and listening to the Megacast. Fire Prevention Week is just around the corner. Join volunteer, part-time, and on-call firefighters at this year's Fire Open House. Catch up on your fire safety knowledge with live demonstrations and hands-on activities. 
Chat with local businesses and resources about fire prevention, see some familiar faces, fight future fires, and make some new friends. The West Bloomfield Fire Open House, October 2nd from noon to 3 p.m. at Fire Station 1 on Orchard Lake Road. In the face of COVID-19, staying healthy is important. And now the same is true as we face the flu. Influenza has the potential to infect millions, putting lives and the healthcare system at risk. Fortunately, it's easy to protect yourself. The flu vaccine is safe and effective, and with COVID-19 still spreading, it's essential. To see how you can hit this virus head on, visit michigan.gov flu. Now that the vaccine is available for children five and up, why do you recommend it? Kids are part of the community and they can spread COVID. We're seeing both healthy children getting sick from the virus as well as children with underlying health conditions. They can easily bring the virus home to other people that are vulnerable and make them sick as well. This vaccine can change that and keep children safe. It's essential that your children get vaccinated to protect them, to protect your families, and to protect those in the community around you. Welcome back to the Megacast, our live daily one-hour show about all things Michigan. I'm Tyler Keeft. Learn more about the program at civiccentertv.com slash megacast, where you'll find information on our entire network of stations, including My Michigan TV. This week is National Suicide Prevention Week, a solemn reminder that suicide is the leading cause of death for those 15 to 24 years old. Joining us now on, on the program to talk about the signs and symptoms, as well as what the community can do to prevent suicide, is Carrie Krawick, a therapist at the Birmingham Maple Clinic. Carrie, appreciate you joining us. Absolutely. Good morning. Good morning to you as well. Appreciate having you on. So, uh, of course, uh, this week is a stark reminder that young people are the category of the demographic that is most at risk uh, for suicide. It's the leading cause of death among those 15 to 24 years old. Just how long has that been the case where suicide has been such a prevalent cause of death in this young age group? Gosh, you know, I really can't speak to how long that's been the case, but it has been some time. And of course, more and more often we are hearing reports of um, children plagued by suicide. I think um, the demands of being a young adult or a teen right now are really high. I think um, the advent of social media and um, and other you know forms of phones and texting means there's really no space between your life at school and your life at home. So whatever pressures you're feeling in terms of you know either being bullied or or comparing yourself and not measuring up the things that feel to a young person is very insurmountable um, are surrounding you at all times. Does that youth and still uh, that sort of plasticity to their development and their brain, does that play a role in them being more susceptible, people in this age group being more susceptible to suicidal tendencies or, or taking the act themselves? Sure. I'm not exactly sure what the science says with regards to that, but we can assume that like um, impulsivity and recklessness are, of course, higher, you know, um, a, not a full understanding of um, consequences, you know, and, and a not a full understanding of, of ability and, and ability to overcome obstacles, to develop pride, you know, so I think that um, there, you probably would see it more in relation to certain, certain features of that age. Um, and then again, the certain, certain um, demands or experiences of people that age. We're joined by Carrie Craybrick from the Birmingham Maple, Maple Clinic on the Megacast today. More information on the Birmingham Maple Clinic can be found at BirminghamMaple.com. BirminghamMaple.com for more information. Uh, Carrie, what are some of the common signs uh, of suicide that, that we uh, have heard commonly in the past, but even maybe some new ones uh, that may be popping up, uh, may have been popping up in the last few years? I think I think the newest ones that are popping up in the last few years are, are that there are almost no signs, right? That people are very good at concealing themselves. And you look at celebrities um, that have um, suicide. Anthony Bourdain comes to mind, Chris Cornell. There are some others who um, on the outside, on the surface, looked successful, were doing well. The people who knew them were not indicating anything. Um, and then and still and still they were plagued with this. So I think um, this the sort of pressure or burden to look on the surface like everything's fine is a very hard thing for all of us to navigate, um, which is why it's so important 
to ask those questions, to develop personal intimate connections, to say, to say, how are things going with you, but then be specific. Like one thing that some common things, of course, withdrawal from close people, um, uh, being more isolated, um, more to yourself, especially for young people, more time in their rooms, less time engaging, you know, with the family or peers, certainly any increases in drug or alcohol use, any attempts to quit using, but being unsuccessful and finding yourself using again and sort of being in this cycle of disappointment and shame, but also like needing eating substances to cope. Those things would be sort of obvious indicators that like we need to ask this person, but I think really being bold and saying, do you feel like hurting or harming yourself? Like, do you wish you would die? Um, asking those questions outright and seeing what kind of answer you get, even if it's just a change in body language, may be very informative. And so, as you mentioned, there, there are certain questions that we can ask or we should be asking those that we believe may have suicidal tendencies. Uh, and you mentioned one of them, just straight out right asking them if they're having any thoughts of harming themselves or, or taking their own life. What are the other questions that we should be asking? And when should we be asking these questions to someone we're concerned about? Like, again, I think often if you're concerned about a person, it can change from time to time, especially a person who has depression. Um, and so I think to say, right, to say, do you have thoughts of hurting or harming yourself? Um, if you do, what are those thoughts? So like, and, and have you thought about what you would do? If you were going to act on this, what would you do? So you're always assessing, so do they have the thoughts? Yes or no. If yes, what would they do? Um, if they've thought of anything they would do, whether realistic or sort of impossible, that's another like level of indication how severe things are. If it's possible, so if they have had the thought, have a plan, and the plan is possible, you know, like they have access to their plan, because um, that would be the third question. Do you have access to things that make this plan possible? If you get three yeses, that you need to absolutely go to an emergency room um, a trained professional call 911 for a full evaluation. And in, in these cases, it, it can be difficult to kind of navigate these conversations with somebody that's having those tendencies. You know, maybe they are uh, in denial about those tendencies, at least outwardly, although they mm -hmm. know that they're having them. Uh, or maybe, you know, you get to that point where you ask those questions, you are getting those, you know, two yeses, three yeses total. Mm -hmm. And you uh, are at a point where that concern has been kind of confirmed and this person that you care about needs to seek some attention. How do you go about taking that next step with that person? Because you can't really force anyone to do anything uh, in that regard. You're really trying to help this person help themselves. Absolutely. I think this is a very important thing, too, because often it's young people telling other young people and then someone else is left with that information, which which I say in a lot of ways is like above their education and training. So if you have a teenager, young adult person telling another teenager, young adult person, then saying, don't tell anyone. I told you this. I think the people that are the receivers of that information need to know that 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 is too much of a burden for them to carry, that they don't have the education skills or training to know what to do with that information, and that the absolute best thing they can do is tell another adult or um, supportive person in that person's life so that they can help that person, even if they've been sworn to secrecy. Um, it's a matter of life and death, and it's really an unfair, it's really an unfair piece of information for them to hold, and they're really not qualified to hold it. We're joined by Carrie Krawick from the Birmingham Maple Clinic joining us on today's edition of the MegaCast Suicide Prevention Week is, four, is uh, September 4th through the 10th. That is this week, of course, in Suicide Prevention Month as well. The leading cause of death for those 15 to 24 years old. Learn more information on suicide, including uh, some more questions or some more sort of uh, examining, uh, examinary things you can do uh, to kind of uh, look into whether or not somebody you may have concerns about maybe having those suicidal tendencies, you can visit cdc.gov cdc slash suicide, cdc.gov slash suicide. And if uh, you know someone or you yourself are, are experiencing a mental health distress or are considering suicide, uh, 988 is a suicide and crisis lifeline. You can call that and also chat at 988lifeline.com. Dot org 988lifeline.org the 988 hotline is confidential free and available 24 hours a day 7 days a 7 days a week uh, Carrie, uh in in terms of what happens after you take that action and you start to help this person or they're going through and kind of working through that situation they're having their mental health struggles 
what more should people be doing at that point? Because there's a lot you can do to help, but there's also a lot that you can do to kind of get in the way and maybe cause some setbacks. Absolutely. I think, right, like there are things that people do even inadvertently that actually shut down the conversation as opposed to keeping it open, certainly minimizing someone's experience or saying something along the lines of, oh, look at your life. You have nothing to be upset about. I mean, I think um, I heard it put so perfectly once um, being depressed or having depression, the disorder is not about being sad when things are sad. We're all entitled to be sad when things about our life are sad. Being depressed is actually quite the opposite. It's right. It's about being depressed when there isn't really evidence to be depressed, right? And being depressed anyways, right? That is so so depression depressed the feeling is acceptable, right? When things are upsetting. But being depressed when things are going well is actually quintessentially what makes it a disorder. And so I think people can sometimes say the wrong thing when they say, well, of course, you shouldn't be upset. Everything is fine. That causes people a lot of shame and anxiety and makes them feel like you can't, you don't really understand them. From a therapist's angle, from a professional's angle, where does that conversation then begin, those treatments then begin for somebody that is having suicidal tendencies or, or even someone that's in treatment after attempting suicide uh, to, to address that the root issues that led to those ideations or to those actions and, and ultimately put them on, on a safer path and, and a path to recovery from whatever ailments that they are suffering from? Sure. So therapists will look to evaluate sort of the biopsychosocial contributors, meaning um, if there needs to be medication or referral to a psychiatrist would be made. If there's some things about the surrounding environment, if there's a lack of support or, um, you know, a lack of activity or things, then those changes will be made. So, um, so there might be medical changes made. There might be some behavioral changes addressed. Um, and there also might be some cognitive changes is does the person have parts of their brain or mind that they're able to access, that they're able to use to encourage themselves, that they're able to use to challenge those depressed or negative thoughts. Um, can they create new neural pathways to sort of change the way they look at their situation or the world around them or change their own confidence and their ability to handle those things? Um, and, and right, if there needs to be support of a larger family or system, perhaps group therapy or family therapy to help a person feel more um, connected and supported and to help give the family skills to know what are they doing that maybe is contributing harmfully or what are they doing that's contributing well that actually there needs to be more of that done. BirminghamMaple.com is the website for the Birmingham Maple Clinic. We're joined by one of the therapists, Carrie Craywick. On today's edition of the MegaCast, of course, September 4th through September 10th is National Suicide Prevention Week. Uh, and, uh, and here in Oakland County later on this month, actually, the county itself, uh, in partnership with the Oakland Community Health Network, is going to be holding a suicide prevention uh, discussion uh, for that's open to the entire community. That's going to be Wednesday, September 28th, 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. at the Oakland Community Health Network's office in Troy. There's also a virtual option available. You can go to oakgov.com uh, to learn more information about that event. And again, that is Wednesday, September 28th, 2022, 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, and it's uh, Suicide Prevention 101 is also going to be another one of their seminars, 5 p.m. until 6 p.m. Carrie, uh, anything else at this time we haven't discussed today on this matter or, or other mental health matters that we should be aware of at this time? Sure. I think, you know, you touched a lot today on what if you're the supportive family member of somebody. And I think that though that was such a great piece because um, if you aren't sure what to do, even if your friend loved one family member won't seek therapy, it's okay for you to seek therapy and get more advice about how to cope with that, um, where where you're responsible to take care of someone else and what things you need to let go of, um, what strategies you have to cope with the anxiety you have about how your other close person is doing um, is a really important um, part of this that everybody needs to be supported. And, and, and that just prompted something in, in my mind, Carrie. Uh, before I let you go, I do want to touch also briefly on what to do in, after the unfortunate scenario where someone in your life has taken their life, has uh, has gone through uh, with suicide, because uh, I, I've experienced that before and uh, just after graduating high school. And what I struggled with more than anything in, the, in that immediate moment after was, well, how do I address this with my mutual friends with this person, with their family, with uh, with their family, and so on. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do in the situation that is potentially that may potentially you know, trigger this person or may actually be helpful 
to these people. So what advice do you have for those that are in the, uh, uh, someone's life that may take their life or, or even just uh, attempt suicide to help others around them go through the aftermath of that situation? Sure. Have, having known someone who's successfully suicided, um, whether in your family or close loved one, actually puts people at higher risk for suicide and suicidal thoughts themselves. So taking care of yourself is so important. I think of the examples you said is, is just being honest and authentic. You cannot always control what you will say or won't say, would or wouldn't be triggering to someone else. But being honest, I think avoiding should, I should have said this, or they should have done that, or I shouldn't have said this. I always say that don't, don't say should. If you acknowledge, if you say something and you're reading another person's feedback and you say, I'm sorry, did that cross the line? Or, you know, this was just my experience, you know, to really sort of take ownership and responsibility for what you're saying and, and not allow it for yourself to feel like it is controlling someone else. They have the right to, to say, Hey, this is information I didn't want to know, or I don't want to talk about right now, or excuse me, that if each person sort of allows for that um, kind of a bounce in the volley, like if you were playing tennis, it doesn't have to just be hard balls back and forth, but it's okay if there's like sort of a little misstep and then you just make a correction and bounce it back. Well, Carrie, I appreciate your time and appreciate your advice on this issue that it is so tough for so many people to navigate uh, and it can be really tough for people to just simply have an informed conversation about. Appreciate it. I appreciate it too. I think making people more comfortable to have the conversations is the most important step we can take. Definitely agree. Thank you so much, Carrie. Thank you. Get in contact with the Birmingham Maple Clinic at BirminghamMaple.com, BirminghamMaple.com. And again, that uh, national, uh, sui the uh, Suicide Prevention Call to Action event, your role in suicide prevention, a call to action through Oakland County in partnership with the Oakland County Suicide Prevention Task Force and the Oakland Community Health Network is Wednesday, September 28th, 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. is the main seminar at the Oakland Community Health Network office. 5505 Corporate Drive in Troy. There's a virtual option available as well. Then there's a follow-up Suicide Prevention 101, 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. that same day, oakgov.com slash health for more information. Let's take a break. When we come back, we'll talk energy and ecology with Nick Dodge from the nonpartisan Michigan League of Conservation Voters. You're watching and listening to the Megacast. Mark your calendars for the 11th annual Family Fun Night at West Bloomfield High School. Stop by on Friday, September 16th at 5 p.m. for an evening of free, fun activities as we honor our military, police, and fire heroes. Plus, stick around to see Laker football take on Clarkston at 7 p.m. To find out more, scan the QR code on your screen or visit wbsd.org forward slash community forward slash family fun night. Let's savor these moments, made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. Keep the dining out going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Let's relish these moments made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. Keep the festivals going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Can I ask you a question? Why do you want to get the COVID-19 vaccine? I don't like getting sick. The virus will die. It will be easy to not catch it. Keep my family safe and keep playing soccer. Because I love being vaccinated. What's your hope for everyone? I hope everybody gets the vaccine. To keep safe and strong. Be like happy, having fun everywhere. Everyone stay safe and hope you get the vaccine. Welcome back to the Megacast. I'm Tyler Keefe. You're joining us on our live daily one-hour TV, radio, and streaming show about all things Michigan. Learn more about the program by visiting civiccentertv.com slash megacast, where you'll find the Megacast, where you'll find us on demand 
and also be able to find more information on our entire network of stations. That includes My Michigan TV and their free apps for your smartphone and your smart TVs. Joining us now on the Megacast is Nick Dodge. He's the communications director at the Michigan League of Conservation Voters. Nick, thank you for being with us today. Hey, thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Yeah, glad to have you on with us. First off, if you can give us some background information on the Michigan League of Conservation Voters and kind of the efforts that you're making uh, in uh, both out in the community and in the political realm uh, right here in Michigan. Yeah, of course. Um, so we are a leading nonpartisan uh, political organization here in Michigan. We're dedicated to protecting our air, our land, our water, public health, and our democracy. Um, we do that through getting people involved in the political process and making sure people are know who their state representatives and state senators are and um, you know giving them opportunities to hold them accountable and we do that by providing them resources opportunities to get engaged we also are get involved in elections as well um, we believe in a something we call a cycle of accountability where um, that starts with first educating decision makers and, and candidates and the public about the issues impacting our air our land and our water and our democracy and then we work to get elected uh, environmental champions that will champion these issues in the legislature. And then after they're elected, we work to hold them accountable while they are in office by getting people involved and making sure that they stay true to the promises that they made on the campaign trail. In what ways has those have those efforts intensified in recent years? Because we are seeing some of the evidence that we've been told about for years regarding climate change uh, being more severe weather events, kind of some odd uh, strings of severe weather events in places we maybe have not seen them before or not commonly seen them before other than maybe one in a hundred years. Uh, I think about last summer when we had a few different massive severe thunderstorm issues that led to several one in a hundred year, year floods in the Detroit area. And then recently another one of the severe thunderstorms we had, it was about 10 minutes long and caused some significant both ecological and uh, of course day-to-day -day life issues here in the Detroit area also. So has that work intensified in recent years given the situation we're seeing with climate change here in the US? A absolutely. Um, I, I think it has uh, entirely uh, accelerated and the momentum around action on climate change is stronger than it ever has been. People are seeing the impacts and they're feeling the impacts. We don't need to convince people that climate change is real or happening. They're seeing it themselves uh, and it's impacting their everyday lives. Um, you referenced, you know, 100 year storms happening seemingly every every few years now. And we know that that's only going to get worse unless we take action. And so we have seen really a groundswell of support. And we're also seeing that in public opinion research as well. More people than ever believe that climate change is an issue that we must address. And I think that's because they are realizing and recognizing that the impacts are, are here. It's no longer tomorrow's problem. It's, it, it's right here today. And that has really motivated people uh, to, to take action, support candidates that have a strong stance on climate change. And we're also seeing uh, more um, momentum in the legislature around uh, policies that will address climate change by investing in clean energy, um, energy efficiency. And those kinds of investments are not only helpful to our planet, but they also help our economy. They create jobs. They help lower and reduce energy costs, make our energy more reliable and affordable. So there's a lot of positives that can happen through action on climate change, aside from you know, stopping the impacts as well. You mentioned uh, energy efficiency and clean energy solutions for the future that may help with some of these uh, issues, but also help some of our communities with common issues we're having in our day-to-day -day life as a result of some of the more severe weather events that we're seeing much more commonly than we did uh, in decades past and even in just years past recently. Uh, and, and it comes back to what we had a couple of weeks back with the, de with the the severe thunderstorm in Southeast Michigan. It took out power for a large sum of people 
under the realm of DTE Energy. And the response from DTE Energy was that, well, this is, A, it was the severe weather event, it was the high winds, it was the damages to some of the tree structures, but you know, this could have been a lot worse if we weren't you know, trimming and cutting down trees to prevent even further outages. That brings up a couple issues. A, some of the, the deficiencies in our current energy systems are amounting like they haven't before, but also some of the solutions that have been proposed by some of these utilities are also those that may significantly affect our local e uh, ecology and our local environment by trimming and cutting down some of these trees. So how does an organization like yours address those kinds of issues and work A, with these organizations, but also those in political leadership on a local, state, and federal level to find those solutions that A, help prevent some of these issues in everybody's day-to-day -day life, but also B, aren't exacerbating issues out in our environment? Yeah. So first, I really just want to underscore the fact that Michigan is is unique in in our reliability and our um, energy costs. So these are um, numbers pulled from federal energy data. It gets uh, um, pulled together, and a, a group in Michigan called the Citizens Utility Board of Michigan helps compile this into a report that they produce every year. Um, and we know from the most recent data that Michigan has the worst. Uh, service in the Midwest when it comes to outages and time to restore power after an outage, and we pay the highest electricity costs in the Midwest. Uh, and this is not a new problem. This has been the case for years. And what we see from the utility companies is just not an adequate response to uh, the continued poor service that they're providing. Um, meanwhile, we're also seeing energy rates continue to rise. Over the past five years, DT has raised their rates four times, and that's totaled more than $750 million. And that's money that residential rate payers have to continue to pay more and more on their bills every month. And so our main issue is that we keep getting our rate our rates raised and our electricity costs keep going up, but our service continues to be abysmal. And we think that that status quo that, that we've been living through is not adequate and it needs to be changed. And so our, our position is that really this is a problem on the planning side from, from the very top of the, organize, of the organization of the utility companies. Um, we are not complaining about the uh, line workers and the utility workers. We think we know they're working hard. We know they're doing the best job they can. It's really, but they've been kind of set up to fail because at the very top, they haven't been properly investing in the grid and investing in these solutions to protect us, which is why we're in this situation we're in right now. Um, I will say there is some, uh, there are lawmakers uh, in the legislature um, that have been working to address these problems. Um, two of them are Representative Abraham Ayash in Detroit and Representative Yusuf Rabi in Ann Arbor, they in April, they introduced legislation that would directly address and provide relief to customers when the power goes out. Their legislation would make bill credits for when the power goes out automatic, um, which has a huge impact because people are losing their groceries for the week. They have life-saving medical equipment that they need to continue to power. And when the lights go out and the power goes out for days on end, that causes serious challenges and concerns for them. And so their legislation would make those bill credits automatic so people don't have to go through a bunch of hoops to apply for a credit and maybe they get it, maybe they don't. And a lot of people don't know about it. And then two, it would give customers $5 per hour in an outage after five hours. And then if the power outage lasts more than 20, uh, more than three days, it would give them $25 an hour. So these are this is significant money. And we believe that it's appropriate because the cost that people are enduring for when their power goes out is is tremendous. And a lot of times it is impacting people in poor communities and communities of color where the, it, 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 they're already struggling with high costs. And so um, I think this legislation is really important. It addresses a need that's here right now and an urgent issue. And we haven't really seen any uh, action on that, which is disappointing. Um, the legislature's on out on long recess, and we think that they need to come back and start passing legislation to uh, make make these issues, uh, you know, get resolved and, 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 and 
put people better off here in Michigan when it comes to power outages and um, their energy bills. Yeah, the uh, a large majority of the people that are under the umbrella of DTE Energy lost their power during in southeastern Michigan, at least, uh, during those thunderstorms just a couple of weeks ago. We're joined by Nick Dodge from Michigan League of Conservation Voters on today's edition of the MegaCast. And you mentioned uh, some of these issues are, are primarily, or in particular, affecting communities of color and impoverished communities. You think about uh, year, in the years past, uh, the Flint water crisis, which still is yet to be fully resolved uh, in an effective way. And then you think about similarities in the South, in Jackson, Mississippi, to that issue, seeing some of these uh, way outdated uh, way, way outdated infrastructure having an impact now on these communities, especially after severe weather events that affect the entire environment around them, that's, which then also affects, uh, affects what's under the ground. So what is being done at, at, uh, at your organization's level and in communication with local communities, as well as leadership in government to address some of these issues, particularly in those most vulnerable communities? Yeah. <clears throat> Um, yeah, it, it's a major it's a major issue, and we're seeing that um, you know low income communities are uh, you know experiencing the worst uh, when the power goes out. Um, I, I will say, the Michigan Public Service Commission, um, which is a governmental body, it's got three commissioners that are appointed by the governor. Their main task and responsibility is to regulate the utility companies in Michigan, and so each time that DTE Energy say has a rate increase that they want. They need to bring that before the Michigan Public Service Commission. Every time they uh, produce, you know, their five-year energy plan, they need to bring that before that body and get it approved. And there's a public comment process through this all where the public is able to weigh in and provide their perspective. And we saw DT has a current rate case that they're trying to get approval for. And so on August 22nd, after a lot of pressure was put on the Michigan Public Service Commission by a, a lot of frontline organizations, organizations that are working on the ground in Southeast Michigan and, and other places. They put uh, the pressure on the Michigan Public Service Commission to come to, to Detroit and hold a public field hearing on this rate case so the people who are most impacted by these rate increases can speak their mind and voice their concerns. And so they did that. That happened on August 22nd. We saw um, absolutely packed hearing room. It was three hours of back to back to back public comment from people in, in Detroit talking about the, the grievances that they're having when their power goes out and how their energy costs are too high. And we heard a lot of stories about how uh, in certain neighborhoods, um, they're the last to get restored and they're the first to go out when the power goes out. And so there's some real disparities here when it comes to power outages and energy costs. And so what we're what we're calling for is we're calling on the Michigan Public Service Commission, which is our backstop. They're, they are supposed to have our interests, the public ratepayers' interests in mind. We're calling on them to really take a close look at this rate case and reject it. It's a $388 million rate, rate increase right now. That would be about $10 per month for residential customers. And we just think that the rate increases that they've had at year after year have not resulted in better service for us. And so we we really think they need to, you know, take some of that money out of out of shareholder profits. I mean, the, the utility companies continue to make windfall profits. Um, they operate in a regulated monopoly. They don't have to compete against anyone. And so there really is no reason why our grid isn't isn't up to par with where it should be. And so we're really calling on the Michigan Public Service Commission to hold the utilities accountable and put the Michigan ratepayers first. Yeah, especially in those communities that are that are uh, most affected by by this, uh, of course, especially for prolonged outages, uh, where their work depends on their home uh, having power, where uh, you know, they have food that they are barely able to put on the table, or ha will have to choose if they have to replace it between putting food on the table or paying their bills that month. That is a tough decision to make, especially when reimbursements from these companies in these scenarios are uh, directly from DTE, $25, which I don't think is covering anybody's grocery bills at any time. Nick, appreciate your time. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Take care.
Yeah, you, you as well. Good to have you on with us. We've been joined by uh, Nick Dodge from the League of Conservation Voters, a nonpartisan organization here in the state of Michigan. We'll take a break. And on the other side, all schools in Michigan are back in session after Labor Day. And we'll talk to one of our local uh, ISDs, the Oakland, School, Oakland Schools, and their new de deputy superintendent, Ken Gutman, who joins us next on the Megacast. Let's savor these moments, made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. Keep the dining out going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Let's relish these moments, made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. Keep the festivals going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Can I ask you a question? Why do you want to get the COVID-19 vaccine? I don't like getting sick. The virus will die. It will be easy to not catch it. Keep my family safe and keep playing soccer. Because I love being vaccinated. What's your hope for everyone? I hope everybody gets the vaccine. To keep safe and strong. Be like happy, having fun everywhere. Everyone stay safe and hope you get the vaccine. Welcome back to the Megacast, our live daily one-hour TV, radio, and streaming show about all things Michigan. I'm Tyler Keith. You can learn more about the program and find us on demand on civiccentertv.com slash megacast, where you'll also find links to each and every one of our partnering TV, radio, and streaming outlets that join us live and live to tape each and every day throughout the work week. Joining us now on the Megacast is a new deputy superintendent for Oakland Schools and ISD, supporting uh, several school districts all throughout the Oakland County area. Ken Gutman joins us now on the Megacast. Ken, thanks for being with us again. Uh, good morning, Tyler. It's great to see you. It's been a while. Good to see you as well. And in your new role at Oakland Schools, how are things going uh, in your new role as the deputy superintendent now that all of our schools here in Oakland County are back in session? Well, it's certainly picked up a little bit since everybody's back in session, but it's a good role. I get a chance to work in a number of areas, work with districts across the county, and uh, I get to work with an outstanding superintendent, Dr. Juanico Robinson. So uh, it's been an interesting adjustment, uh, missing the students, but, uh, but I'm enjoying the new role. There's always uh, some growing pains at the beginning of any school year. Given the circumstances of this school year being really the first one where we're going into it in, uh, since 2019, the first year where we're really going into it uh, without COVID-19 being a significant factor in how we're educating our kids, whether it be from uh, going partially virtual and partially in person or certain regulations that are mandated to be in place. So how is that affecting our schools going back into session and, and some more, to, and so to speak, normal terms. Well, I think it feels great. I, I, I have not heard a complaint yet. I think everybody feels like we're having, and I don't want to use air quotes, I'll just say a normal year to start. And we certainly hope it stays that way. Uh, I think that teachers and staff and administrators feel the freedom now to um, ideally return to a normal setting while still taking the lessons learned during the pandemic and, and incorporating some of, uh, of that learning. So what are some of those lessons that were learned that are being more widely incorporated into our kids' education now uh, that were implemented as a result of COVID-19 and, and to combat uh, COVID-19 in the classroom? Sure. So it's less of a COVID-19 thing, but more of a learning in that uh, we did find that for some students, virtual options do work. It's not for everyone. Uh, I don't think I could learn that way. I certainly prefer to be in person as a student. I, I'm Sure, Tyler, you feel the same way, but for a lot of people, uh, or for a number of students, online learning works. And so, what are the opportunities we have to incorporate some of that after hours, weekends, evenings, so we can uh, be more accessible to all students, allow other options other than in person? I think that's something that ideally we'll start to see in the future. 
We're joined by Ken Gutman. He is the Deputy Superintendent of Oakland Schools. Joining us today on the Megacast, you can find more information on Oakland Schools, the way that they're helping your local school district at oakland.k12.mi.us. I'll say that one more time. It's a lot of dots. oakland.k12.mi.us for more information. Uh, Ken, for those that aren't familiar with the work of, of their ISD here in Oakland County, what are some of the ways that Oakland Schools is supporting our local school districts proper? And thank you for using the word support, Tyler, because we are a support agency. We are a support service agency. We provide service to the 28 local school districts in Oakland County, as well as the 22 public school academies. And so there are economies of scale to be achieved in terms of special education, uh, uh, finance, business and operations, uh, professional learning. In fact, we have a couple hundred educators here today working on literacy essentials. Uh, there's a lot that we can accomplish on a district level in terms of leadership and in terms of saving district money and providing resources for that. We know that some students uh, and the disparities between certain school districts became so much more visible during the course of the COVID-19 pandemic. With that in mind, uh, how has the, not necessarily the mission of Oakland schools, but uh, the action of Oakland schools in fulfilling its mission maybe been modified, uh, not post-pandemic, but as we're you know, transitioning away from the thick of the pandemic to address some of those disparities in our school districts, even, even right here in Oakland County? Thank you. So just as we need to be individualized for students, Oakland schools provide service to each district as they need the service. And so it's really more of an individualized approach as different districts deal with different issues. We're there to support them in any way we can, whether it's instructionally, whether it's in terms of leadership, whether it's in terms of the public facing aspects of the district. Our job is to individualize that assistance to make sure we're providing the support they need as they need it. We're joined by Ken Gutman, Deputy Superintendent of Oakland Schools, joining us on today's edition of the Megacast as he begins uh, his role as Deputy Superintendent during the school year. Uh, recent news from Michigan State Assessment Scores uh, because of COVID said that because of COVID dis disrupted learning, uh, they were actually pushed further down in reading and writing for all grades tested at college readiness for juniors was pushed down to 28 percent and produced mostly declines in math in oakland county and in our schools how is that uh, being addressed uh, and really on a broader scale this uh, the, this buzz term of learning loss that may or may not have been prevalent in some of these school districts because of COVID 19. well i think it's all over the map within our county and within our state i know overall oakland county has done better than most in the state and at the same time it means nothing if your child has learning loss that's what's most important to you and so, uh, again, we need to dig into that data. I want to make sure it's relevant data. I, I've heard some data quoted that, that was taken during the pandemic, and I don't know if that's relevant at a time when the MSTEP was not administered to all students. But ultimately, literacy and numeracy are key essentials to successful, uh, successful or to success of students. And again, for example, we have a couple hundred people here today working on literacy essentials, changing the way we deliver literacy across the county in a research-based manner. So. Uh, that's certainly the foundation uh, that we have a literacy base and a numeracy base. And so uh, we're going to continue to work on that. And certainly there may be remediation in some places and extension of learning in other places. And we're here to support uh, districts and, and staff in that as well. We're joined by Ken Gutman, Deputy Superintendent of Oakland Schools with us on today's edition of the MegaCast. You can learn more about the different ways that your local school district has been supported by the local ISD of Oakland Schools, as well as their other programs for students and others in the community by visiting oakland.k12.mi.us. It's oakland.k12.mi.us for more information, uh, including some of the really interesting programs that they have for kids at all levels. Ken, uh, while we have a few minutes left here, can you give us some uh, some oversight, uh, some insight on uh, and an overview of some of these special programs that are available through the local ISD here in Oakland County that can support students of all ages? Well, we start with professional learning. We have a really powerful team here for professional learning, consultants in, in all core areas, as well as the uh, other areas that, that are taught throughout the county. We provide support to districts in that. Professional learning goes on every day here. Uh, it also goes on virtually throughout the county. We're really proud of that. Our support of special education, our support of finance and business, our support of superintendents and their leadership, as we have a number of new superintendents throughout the county, I think that's pretty robust as well. We're really proud to be able to provide that, Tyler, and we're really fortunate to be able to work with a great number of people throughout the county on behalf of children. 
Uh, Ken, we have a couple more minutes with you before we need to say goodbye today and wrap up today's program. Uh, before we let you go, anything else at this time that would be important for our parents, our, our school districts, our educators to know about the work being done at Oakland schools as we are uh, transitioning into a new school year here in, in the first week for some schools and the second week for many others? Well, certainly we're a resource to everyone in the county. I would encourage parents to reach out to their local district first. Obviously, situations can be resolved as close to the situation as possible. But at the same time, we are here as a resource for our districts and for our parents and for our community to make sure we're taking care of, of, of every one of our children. So uh, we're going to be here for all students. We have somewhere between 175,000 and 200,000 students throughout the county, and we're here to support all of them. Well, Ken, we appreciate your time. Thank you for joining us. And again, congratulations on your new role at Oakland Schools. Thank you so much, Tyler. And again, it's always a pleasure to see you. You as well, oakland.k12.mi.us for more information on their programs and the ways that they're supporting school districts like yours in your community. That is going to do it for today's edition of the MegaCast. I want to give a big thank you to everybody that joined us on this edition of the program. Carrie Craywick from the Birmingham Maple Clinic, Nick Dodge from the Michigan League of Conservation Voters, and of course, Ken Gutman from uh, Oakland Schools who joined us on today's program. If you're just tuning in, you missed some of these interviews or you're really interested in certain interviews that you missed earlier on in the program, you can find those on demand mid to late afternoon every single day at civiccentertv.com slash megacast. You'll also find links to every single one of our partnering TV, radio, and streaming outlets so you can watch us in your local community and take us on demand and take us mobile live or live to tape anywhere all across Michigan and around the U.S. on apps such as the My Michigan TV app and on our website at civiccentertv.com on our Watch Live page on your smartphone and on your, sm uh, and on your uh, laptops and tablets as well. civiccentertv.com slash megacast. Also want to give you a, a, another prompt to go to our local news page for updated information on COVID-19 in your community, whether you're here in Oakland County where we originate our broadcast or in places all throughout various regions of the state, the Upper Peninsula, the Upper Lower Peninsula, up north, uh, the western side of the state, southwestern Michigan, wherever you're at in the Great Lakes State, we have information on COVID-19 for your specific community from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services and the Centers for Disease Control, as well as the Oakland County Health Division for those of you here in southeastern Michigan to keep you up to date on COVID-19 in your community. In addition, on those pages, on that page, we have links to articles from across the Great Lakes State every single day, keeping you up to date on news, both on the COVID-19 front and other top stories making headlines right here in Michigan. While you're there, click through those articles, read them in full. And while you're on those pages for those publications, if you have the means to do so, we highly encourage you to subscribe and support local journalism in your community. Big thank you to our crew as well. It makes this program possible every single day. Calvin Brown and Jared Clark out at Master Control, the office of My Michigan TV. And of course, our producer, the king of television, as we call him, Larry Nyland, helping us book each and every show and helping both our guests and me get ready for informative conversations on a number of different topics each and every day. We have uh, coverage of Laker football here in West Bloomfield again this Friday, kickoff 7 o'clock and a pregame at 6.30 right here on Civic Center TV. Head over to our Lakers sports page for more information. In the meantime, that's it for today's MegaCast. We'll return on Friday with a new show.